Uh, I'm Mary Margaret Bell, um, a COSA consultant. I'm pleased to welcome you today on COSA's behalf. Before we start the program, we want to take a few moments to uh, just do a little housekeeping items before the webinar begins. Our presenters, Katherine Skinner and Ann Ackerson, are going to offer opportunities for you to interact during today's presentation. Otherwise, um, please use our chat box for questions or communications during the webinar today. And Catherine and Ann have said that they could accept questions uh, throughout the presentation. Our COSA staff, including IT coordinator Becky Jolson and me, will be monitoring the chat box uh, during the webinar, and we will, of course, use it also at the question and comment and uh, period at the end of the presentation. So now it's just a little bit after the top of the hour. We're going to begin the program. I'm going to introduce our moderator for today's webinar, and it's uh, Jamie Awall from the Tennessee State Archives. And we want to welcome Jamie and thank her for being our moderator today. And I'm going to ask Becky to pass the control uh, to Jamie. Great. Thank you. Uh, welcome on behalf of the COSA Education and Training Committee. Welcome to this COSA monthly webinar series. Uh, my first moderator, so I'm pretty excited. Uh, today's program, we will discuss the Leading Across Boundaries Initiative, which is a national effort involving a wide range of leadership training stakeholders from the archives, museum, and library communities, including COSA. The initiative was funded by the IMLS and hosted by the Educopia Institute. Together, the team documented existing practices and needed competencies, built cross-germination tools and strategies, and developed open, freely available curriculum and evaluation tools for use across these fields. One of the tools the project team developed was the layers of leadership, which can help professionals assess their leadership challenges and skills toolkits, and that's what our presenters will be talking about today. But before we move into the uh, agenda, let me, uh, excuse me, into the program, let me give you a few details on the agenda. The presentation will last for about 45 minutes, and there will be time at the end for questions and answers, as Mary indicated. Please type your questions into the chat box, and we will um, pull those and present them to our presenters. After the program, Mary Margaret will return with some announcements and will provide information on upcoming webinars, programs, and events through COSA. So our presenters today are Katherine Skinner and Ann Ackerson. Dr. Katherine Skinner is the Executive Director of the Educopia Institute, a not-for-profit educational organization that builds networks and collaborative communities to help cultural, scientific, and scholarly institutions achieve greater impact. Dr. Skinner received her PhD from Emory University. She's co-edited three books and has authored and co-authored numerous reports and articles. She's currently principal investigator for research projects on continuing education, digital preservation, and scholarly communication. She regularly teaches graduate courses and workshops in digital librarianship and preservation topics and provides consultation services to groups that are planning or implementing digital scholarship and digital preservation programs. Ann Ackerson is the communications coordinator and former executive director for COSA. During her tenure as the executive director, Ann had the privilege of representing COSA on the Leading Across Boundaries project. She's co-authored, excuse me, she is co-author of the book Leadership Matters, which looks at state leadership in the nation's history and cultural heritage museums. It was published in 2013 by the Altamira Press as part of the American Association for State and Local History series. It's under revision this year. She facilitates an eight-week online course on museum leadership and administration for the American Association for State and Local History. And she co-teaches a course on museum leadership for the Johns Hopkins University Museum Studies Graduate Program. So without further ado, I will pass the uh, controls over to Dr. Skinner. 
All right, thank you so much, Jamie, for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm gonna assume that everyone can hear me unless I hear y'all say otherwise. <laughs> so we are so delighted to be with all of you today, and we're really looking forward to sharing some information with you about one of the key deliverables from the Nexus project, which, uh, as Jamie mentioned, the, the subtitle of that project was Leading Across Boundaries. And this was a project that was led by Educopia Institute in partnership with the Center for Creative Leadership, which we'll talk about during the presentation, and then also with 38 library archives and museum associations. So this was, uh, a, this is a tool that really has been informed by practices across the field and across all kinds of different disciplines, uh, sectors, uh, and other divisions within our extended library archives and museum space. So we call this tool the Layers of Leadership Framework, and it's a tool that can be used by individuals or by organizations or even by associations as kind of a scaffolding tool to help leaders develop at every stage of their career and in every department or division of an organization. So why the focus on leadership? Um, you know, from, from our perspective, as we were starting this project, we saw in the, the broad field, we being not only Educopia, but also many of our partners, um, looking at the system level across libraries, archives, and museums, we saw how many organizations and organizational directors believe that leadership development is too expensive or that it's all about the kind of training experiences or sabbaticals that they may be able to, to give to uh, higher level leaders. Um, they also often thought or we heard expressed by many that, that leaders within organizations thought of leadership development as something that was nice to have but ultimately not necessary as a kind of employee benefit or that the only person within the organization that actually needs leadership development is, of course, the person who's leading the organization itself. Um, and we see that as a big fallacy. Uh, and we see all of those things, for that matter, as a big uh, fallacy. And we see that, that falsehood as something that really could jeopardize the vision and mission and the ability to, to uh, deliver on vision and mission in libraries, archives, and museums. Because in reality, Leadership development is crucial today, and perhaps especially for cultural organizations like libraries, archives, and museums. So what we see as imperative for uh, these types of organizations today are really forward-thinking and articulate leaders. And we see a, a situation today where all of us as libraries, archives, and museums are struggling to deal with external realities that include increased competition for our funding and for our audiences. So to put it mildly, the paradigm shift from print to digital, coupled with all of the different political changes that we've seen in the U.S. context, even just within the last decade, those things have led to decreases in funding for our organizations, both on our operational budgets and then also in grant opportunities. And they've also significantly increased the number of competitors that are immediately available to our prospective users, including those users, that, those uh, types of things that users can access with their fingertips. And so strong leadership can help us to transform the challenges that we're facing today into real opportunities. And, uh, and that's one piece of why we wanted to focus on leadership. We also see strong leadership as imperative for these organizations today because we're caught in this well-predicted, there were lots of studies showing that this was gonna happen, but still surprising as it happens, retirement cycle that is just fast and furious in its pacing. So we're in need of new leaders who are ready to assume the directorship uh, over our libraries, archives, and museums with fresh perspectives, but also with a, a serious awareness of how organizations work. And so the sheer volume of new directors that are needed today is creating significant challenges on the ground as any institution that is trying to recruit leadership can really attest. So those are a couple of the things that we were thinking about as we began to work. We were also thinking about the way that studies today show that leadership development actually has a really high return on investment. So those organizations that are investing in leadership development activities are shown to have more mission impact, higher revenues, lower costs, and greater overall stability than other organizations. And we also see that leadership development doesn't have to be expensive, which is one of those fallacies that I mentioned a moment ago. 
in order for them to be effective. And studies, uh, especially some of the studies that have come out in the last 12 years or so, just they harp on the value of what they call the 70-20-10 rule, where what you do is you focus about 70% of your development activity on creating and monitoring stretch assignments for employees, about 20% of the time and energy on things like structured mentorship, and then only about 10% on the actual training experiences. So these are some of the things that we see as important in the uh, creation. I'm not sure how the slides have moved. Forgive me I on did that. that. I'm sorry. Oh, I okay. Sorry. <laughs> I moved it back. I was like, wait a second. Where did it go? Um, in every case, that that uh, gives a, a very different perspective than that which we see so often uh, taken by leaders who think that, you know, it's it's all about a training experience. So just a little bit of background on the layers of leadership themselves. Um, as I mentioned, these were developed in partnership between Educopia Institute, the Center for Creative Leadership, which is one of the top uh, five in the world from Forbes for both nonprofit and for-profit uh, leadership training. It's a really fantastic group and, and provided us with a backbone that, you know, was kind of a, a dream for a project like this. Uh, we also had 38 partners across the library, archive, and museum association space. So all of the major uh, national, many of the, the major uh, regional and state-based, and then also many discipline-based uh, organizations were a part of this. It was supported by IMLS funding, and we issued the layers of leadership in the last year of the project, which was in 2017. So these are still semi-hot off the press. They were just about half a year ago that we, we put these out into the world. They're all licensed with CC BY licensing, which means that anybody can take and use these in any way that they want to as long as they give attribution. And they're available freely for download and use. And you can see the, the URL on your screen, and you can also find these very easily by searching on the Educopia website. So in terms of the authors and partners, I'm going to transition over to Anne and let her share a little bit about that. Thanks, Catherine. And uh, before I, I talk a little bit about this slide, I just want to draw people's attention to the fact that we have a poll question up over in the lower right-hand side of your screen. We'd like to know how many of you have participated in a leadership training or development opportunity in the last 12 months. So let, let us know that, and as you're doing that, I'll talk a little bit about the authors and the partners. We included this slide uh, to underscore the fact that leadership training and development is not owned by any one profession. All libraries, archives, and museums grapple with identifying and nurturing leadership within their ranks. Building the layers of leadership framework was, therefore, a group effort requiring input from across the library, archives, and museum Spectrum. Library Archives and Museums also has an acronym, LAM, L-A-M, so you might hear that come, come out of us every once in a while. So the, the authors for Layers of Leadership, you can see us there. I was one of a big group uh, representing COSA, a big group of, of folks who came from a variety of perspectives, um, and it was a, a, a really... Um, a, uh, a really dedicated uh, and smart, smart group of, of collaborators. And the project's partners, as Catherine mentioned, numbered 38 altogether. You see there's a, a veritable alphabet soup of project partners, but uh, some of those um, acronyms stand for um, organizations like the Academy of Certified Archivists and the American Library Association, the American Association for State and Local History, the Association of College and Research Libraries, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, the Center for Creative Leadership, the Cooperstown Graduate Program, the Getty Leadership Institute, um, the uh, Johns Hopkins Museum Studies Program, uh, the Library Leadership and Management Association. We also had um, some trainers involved with us uh, through the Lindhurst Group and Maureen Sullivan Associates. So it was a really, uh, a really great mix, and some, um, and and then some subject matter uh, contractors, uh, toolkit consulting and true bearing consulting, and the Center for Creative Leadership, all were there to help guide us to do pieces, big chunks of the work, and uh, really add their, um, 
really add their expertise to, to what we were tackling with this project. So we're getting some answers here on our poll question. Um, and 33% of our audience has, has told us that they they have been involved in some leadership training or development activities within the last 12 months, and 67% of our audience have not been involved in leadership training or development within the last 12 months. So that's really helpful for us to know, and I and I thank you for that. So the layers of leadership. We see leadership training and development as, criti as a critical need at every stage of an individual's professional life, whether they assume the title of leader or not. Our task force was challenged to identify and flesh out what leadership roles might look like across an organization. And we ultimately identified six layers, and they're listed here. Uh, each have their own set of skills and attributes that would speak to the key roles and the specific challenges of that layer. So we have leading self, leading others, leading the department, leading multiple departments, leading the organization, and leading the field. So they kind of build upon one another um, as well. And while our original intention was for the layers of leadership to be used primarily by trainers and institutions hosting training programs, it became readily apparent that individuals would find the framework useful when thinking about their own career development. And I can attest to that um, as I've used it um, in a couple of uh, teaching or working with graduate students where I've introduced this concept of the layers of leadership and we've, we've looked at the layers. And it's really been sort of eye-opening, especially to uh, young, young people who are in school, they're thinking about, you know, building a career in a, in a field, and they've never really thought about their leadership as, as something that can be developed, shaped, uh, built upon over time, and so it's, it's, been a, um, it's been a great tool in that regard as well. Um, so before we leave this slide, uh, we've got a, another poll question up for you, and this one asks, you to tell us where you see your role and challenges um, that, that you're involved with right now uh, and you spend the bulk of your time. At what layer do you feel that the bulk of your time is spent um, in, in this uh, leadership realm? And so we've got all six layers there. And if you check the one that most aligns with your challenges that you face on a day-to-day -day basis or your title, or where you feel you really focus, that would, that would be really helpful to us as well. We see a variety of applications for the layers of leadership materials by associations that offer or are contemplating offering leadership training opportunities by the trainers themselves who'd like some additional um, curricula to uh, incorporate into their current offerings uh, so that they can provide a, sort of a larger framework uh, to think about leadership development by individuals, as we've mentioned, to really help them strategize their leadership career paths, and by professors or teachers to help students better understand the trajectory of leadership and the related challenges and skills needed. So lots of ways to use the, la the layers of leadership and the, and the other pieces of the Nexus Lab uh, project. Catherine, I'm going to throw it back to you. <laughs> okay, that sounds great, Anne. All right, so this is where we get to start diving into some of the layers of leadership uh, documentation. So as a kind of preface to what you're seeing, I want you to, to be aware that these layers are really building from the individual out. So they're envisioning the various leadership roles that one might encounter or aspire to over the course of somebody's career. And each of these layers identifies the key role for that layer and then the most pressing leadership question that faces that layer. And it's really important to note that each one of these layers is not mutually exclusive. So it's not that you're going to necessarily be in one layer or another. 
Um, and, you know, as we're looking at the results from you guys, we have forced you into one layer in, in the poll. And we can see that 40% of you see yourselves at leading the department as your level. And then the rest of you break down semi-equally uh, among the other layers, including 20% uh, of you that see yourselves as leaders in the profession. So we were fortunate in our work to have worked closely with the Center for Creative Leadership, which I mentioned uh, back on the first slide. And, you know, to work with an organization like that, where they have a ton of psychometricians who've been working on validation of, you know, not only leadership competencies, but also on groupings and ways of evaluating uh, for decades and decades. Um, they've pioneered so much of the research around both competency identification and validation. And so with their help, we were able to formulate competencies that are really based on fleshing out some of the key roles and challenges that we see librarians, archives, uh, or archivists, and uh, museum staff dealing with in their jobs. And so as you look at this first slide, which is also the first page of the Layers of Leadership publication, you'll see, as I mentioned before, the key role and the daily challenge that an individual face, uh, faces uh, listed on each one of these leadership layers. Now, before we go any deeper into that, um, and we will talk through uh, each of these layers very briefly in just a moment, I want to point out that these are not hierarchical layers. So that's why we've labeled them with letters rather than numbers. We know that careers progress in many different ways and that it's not as simple as a kind of start as just yourself and then move to leading others and then maybe move to leading a department or multiple departments, et cetera. We don't tend to move in that predictable of a hierarchical uh, trajectory in our careers. And we hope that leaders at different levels are going to be able to spot themselves in this model, not in a progression sort of way, but more in like an undulating narrative over the course of their lives. And I should also mention that all of us have and occupy uh, leadership roles beyond our careers in the very real work that we do uh, in our volunteering, in our home lives, and in other parts of our world. So sometimes each person may be juggling several different layers simultaneously in several different aspects of his or her life. So with all of that preface in place, let's look a little bit more specifically. I'll, I'll guide you through the first three layers uh, very briefly on this slide, and then I'll transition back over to Anne, who will talk through the, uh, the leading uh, the layers D through uh, D, E, and F. Sorry, it's hard to, hard to do that. Um, and, and we'll talk through some of the ways that this works. So with layers A through C, what you see is a real focus on some of the foundational aspects of leadership. So how do you lead as an individual who has no direct reports? Uh, how do you lead when you begin to have either volunteers or staff that answer to you? And then how do you lead when you're in charge of a department? And the work of leaders at these levels is really pivotal, but it's also often underexplored and unsupported. And I would say that's especially true in layers A and B. So again, as we mentioned in one of the, the early slides, a lot of the focus on leadership training, not just in libraries, archives, and museums, but in other fields as well, tends to focus on the kind of leading departments and leading organizations levels. And so being able to explore and support these uh, other forms of leadership or leaders at other levels is really important. And by sheer numbers, the employees in layers A and B tend to dominate most environments. So I want you all to imagine for a moment what these environments could look like if all of those employees, not just the directors, had a clear sense of purpose and drive in order to be able to creatively lead within their own rank and position, whatever that rank and position might be. So uh, Anne, can I transition back over to you for a moment? Sure. Layers D, E, and F describe roles that are highly complex requiring a holistic understanding of the organization as a system of interrelated parts that connect and impact all internal environments as well as a variety of external communities. And as Catherine said, I think most of the leadership literature and the training tends to be focused on these, these, uh, these layers in, this, in D, E, and F and leaders that are in those layers. The work that the leaders do at these levels often leads to opportunities to shape the profession at statewide, national, and international levels, as evidenced in layer F, leading the profession. 
By clarifying the roles and the challenges first, the layers become a useful self-assessment tool for any leader looking to strengthen or recalibrate their leadership capacity. Catherine, we'll dive in now. Sure, absolutely. So we'll dive a little bit deeper now into layer A and start looking at one of these layers in depth. So on the screen, you're gonna see layer A, which is leading self, and there are gonna be corresponding one-page synthesis documents for each of the other five layers as well. And we'll see those over the next five slides. So what the design framework does here is it takes us into a deep dive into each layer where we examine the types of leadership tasks that are most associated with the layer, including the skill sets that are needed to perform the tasks so that positive change occurs for both the individual and then also the workforce, and really ultimately the organization and the field and the community that the organization serves as well. So here in layer A, you'll see that the daily challenge for someone who is leading at the self level is how to navigate the organization in order to have impact and to learn and to grow both technically and then as a leader. So key here is the sense of deliberate expansion of leadership capabilities that an individual at the leading self level is expected to undertake. And I won't read this whole slide to you, of course, but I do wanna highlight just a few things from the columns. So in the second column, we'll start there, it describes the key leadership tasks, like intentionally creating a professional reputation and learning and sharing trends that impact the institution. The third column describes the competencies or the skills that are needed in order to complete these tasks. And so here you see things like articulating a leadership brand, um, recognizing that self-promotion isn't just okay, it's really a positive thing and something that every employee should be undertaking deliberately. And other skills in this layer include things like team building and agile learning and identifying and connecting with mentors. The final two columns identify what the individual is trying to achieve, both personally and then within the organization and the profession. And the fourth column concentrates on the individual and the personal changes that they are striving for, which here includes things like creating, creating and, ex and executing a leadership career plan. And then finally, the fifth layer talks about the outcomes for the organization, for the field, and for the community. So that, for example, here, the organization develops a valued or valuable workforce by cultivating leaders at layer A or at leading the self. And Catherine, I'll just throw in here that we, we know that these are probably difficult to read, um, these slides. I know mine is a little bit fuzzy, so we encourage you to download all this material from the Educopia website and, and, and then take it and look at it at your leisure. Absolutely. So layer B, what you're gonna see here is that you're shifting from the leading self to leading others. And so this marks that moment when a worker needs to delegate work to others, whether those are volunteers or whether they're FTEs. And the daily challenge here is that, you know, I'm, I'm good at doing my own work, but now how do I get work done through others? And the role for individuals in this layer is to engage in creative and transformative teamwork. So again, looking across the columns, the key tasks that a leader at this layer is gonna to need to excel in are things like empowering staff or building strong teams with different perspectives and then doing things like navigating dependencies. Some of the skills and competencies that are highlighted here um, which some of you may be able to see, but as Anne said, we do recognize that the, the text gets very small for a slide here. But some of those skills and competencies that are needed to accomplish this are things like having the ability to motivate others and to do what, what can best be described as talent development. Things that really don't come naturally to most people, but instead require skill building, both on the job and beyond the job. And then with these skills and tasks, leaders in this layer are able to do some things both on a personal level and within their organization field and community levels. So in column four, we see that a leader who cultivates these skills is gonna be able to do things like apply tools and techniques to facilitate collaboration as one example. And then in column five, where it shifts to uh, really thinking about that bigger picture of what the organization or what the world gets uh, from, from skilled leaders in this area, 
we see that organizations have leaders who are experienced in layer that who are experienced in layer B are getting a lot more done and they're better poised to initiate and participate not just in local initiatives but also in cross sector collaboration and information sharing. So that gives you a very quick view of layer B. And now we're going to shift to layer C, which is leading at the department level. And that takes us up another rung in those hierarchical organizations and marks that shift from leading a few volunteers or staff members to really leading a department. And whether that department includes two people or 40, the challenges and tasks and skills and outcomes that are marked here are really things that can help individuals in this layer to build their skills to encourage and foster teams. So the daily challenge here is to help to clearly attach the department's staff and the activities that they do to the overall organization's culture and strategy, and then to map out the practical plans and objectives that give staff clear direction and clear ways to know and measure their accomplishments. The leadership tasks start to grow more complex at this stage, and they include things like championing, and this is directly from this list, championing and connecting to transform staff ideas into innovation, and things like uh, communicating and operationalizing strategy. The skills that are needed likewise are growing more complex at this stage and are building on a lot of the foundation that is layer, uh, laid in layers A and B. So layer C leaders need to be able to differentiate strategy from tactics and to develop and foster a sense of community across the department. And then the outcomes for this layer include that leaders are better equipped to attract resources, which is of course you know, of crucial importance, especially in today's world. And then also that staff are happier and more productive. And I love that combination because as those of us who have led staff uh, are aware, if your staff are happier, they really are more productive. And so giving thought and you know, concentrated training to leaders to help foster those kinds of productive environments uh, is, is really a lot of what this level is about. Anne, I'm gonna turn it back to you for the next three layers. Yep. Um, I, I also just wanna pause here for a moment. Uh, since 40% since of our audience uh, identified that they fall into this layer C, um, I think both Catherine and I would be really curious to hear from you what you think about this. And um, if in fact, we've pegged the daily challenge and the key role and, and, so, and the, the, some of those tasks and skills, if we've, we've, you know, we're right on the money in terms of um, uh, where, where you see your, your work or the bulk of your work um, for those of you in layer C and really for those of you in the other, other layers as well as we go through these. So let's take a look at layer D. And here, this is, um, leading multiple departments. And so we're shifting once again, this time to uh, multiple departments or units uh, where the, the, leaders, the leader's key role is connecting across functions and external systems. At this level, the leader's focus is on aggregating and communicating ideas and information and facilitating collective performance by reducing barriers that can derail teams. In fact, that's the big challenge uh, for, for the leader in this layer is keeping and enhancing uh, those, the people in those departments moving forward for long-term success for the overall organization. The tasks that you see focus on paving the way for success and fostering a sense of community. Leader, leaders at this level think, act, and influence strategically with the goal of being responsive to current trends and issues. So they're you know, they're constantly scanning the landscape uh, for across, perhaps across the, the government sector or the nonprofit sector or the for-profit sector um, to, to find trends and issues that can be adapted and used in the layer D context. Some of the skills that they share with other layers um, include, and you'll notice in column three from the left or the middle column, skills to perform tasks, there's a, down at the bottom, there's a set of sh what we call shared skills. And these are skills that are shared across layers and actually every layer has a set of shared skills. So some of the skills that the layer D leader shares with other layers include such things as polarity thinking 
and encouraging active learning, communication, team building, all the stuff that you, you know, you'd expect and maybe some you wouldn't expect. And as a result, their teams, like the leaders themselves, are agile and often innovative. And that's, that's part of the greater outcome piece. Uh, is you're building an organization that's agile and often innovative. Let's move to the next layer, layer E, leading the organization. Now, many of you on today's webinar are leaders of your agency or organization. And as such, your role is to envision and shape your organization's culture, infrastructure, and strategies. Your daily challenge is figuring out how to strengthen or transform your organization or agency so that it continues to be relevant and adds value to the communities that it serves. You're the keeper of your organization's mission and vision, and as such, you have the responsibility of articulating your organization's value internally and externally. You're the chief advocate, the chief strategist, the chief networker, and partner. And as such, you model and create culture change. Your employees, your volunteers, and external stakeholders look to you to do just that. While you share many skills with the leaders within your organization, make no mistake, it is your ability to catalyze, exchange, and develop ideas into action that attract support, partnership, and followership. The benefit of an organizational leader with these skills results in increased awareness and recognition for the organization, along with an understanding that it is a critical part of the community fabric. And then finally, layer F, leading the profession. Now I'll tell you that when our team was developing the layers, we were focused on leaders within institutions. There was no layer F until one of our team members raised the idea that the logical extension of a leader's work is the impact that she or he makes on the profession. And it was an aha moment and layer F was born. I hope we know that wherever a leader is on an organizational chart, she or he has the potential to impact the profession. One doesn't have to be at the top of an organization or have decades of experience behind them. And I want to underscore that, because that, that very idea because we see it at COSA all the time, particularly in the work of our Siri committees, but in other committees as well. Leaders at this level care as much about the impact their work is making on the profession as on the institution where they work. These are the leaders who want to help their profession constructively examine itself and evolve. They're the thought leaders the challengers of the status quo, the visionaries, and yes, the risk takers. They're able to think across and outside the profession, to embrace libraries, archives, and museums as a single integrated ecosystem with shared challenges and shared potential. These are the leaders who can articulate issues, bring divergent voices into the conversation, integrate trends and ideas, and encourage experimentation. The result of their vision and strategic thinking can reframe the value of a profession, attract recognition across distinct communities, and give a stronger voice to libraries, archives, and museums on, on both a national and an international stage. And then our last slide goes back to something I mentioned, the, the shared skills. So you'll recall that in the preceding framework slides, our team had identified these skills that we see being shared across all the, some or all the layers. And this slide illustrates what that looks like. The far left column are leadership skills that we identified in more than one layer. And they include leading organizational culture, there's polarity thinking again, agile learning, effective communications, spanning boundaries, developing expertise, team building, and innovation leadership. And and here we begin to drill down further to think about how these shared skills vary from level to level. So for example, let's take agile learning here. Agile learning begins on the far left um, in leading self with appreciating one's strengths and the strengths of others. 
And then that sets the stage for a, a person appreciating and nurturing strengths across an organization and encouraging staff and boards to become more active, more active and curious learners about the organization and the profession. And by the time you get to the far right-hand side of this chart, you've got um, a leader who's encouraging her community partners to learn about the organization and the profession as well, knowing that they will in turn uh, become better advocates uh, for her organization and profession perhaps uh, for the investment that she's making in, in creating those kind of learning opportunities. So um, Catherine and I have uh, presented a lot of top line information to you and we encourage you to take your time delving more deeply into the layers um, to do that on your own certainly, but we encourage you to share this and uh, talk about it with your colleagues, perhaps even your supervisors or your direct reports. Uh, this may be the kind of thing that um, uh, you want to touch upon in performance evaluations or just when you're sitting down with staff um, and kind of talking about where they see their careers going in your agency. Anyone who is contemplating taking on more leadership uh, responsibilities I think would um, would would value having a document like this to, to sort of see how um, the skills unfold over the various layers. And kind of, and as a result, it really helps to prepare people for, for those training opportunities. Um, and, um, and that, you know, I think can ultimately be a, a great thing for an organization. Um, so I'm right now going to pass uh, the microphone back to Jamie. Uh, for some questions and answers, or at least questions. <laughs> Jamie? <laughs> Great. Thank you. And um, it looks like we had not a, a question come in, but a comment um, from someone who says, thank you for including apply outcomes oriented evaluation methods. I just wish this was also included in the previous layers. In addition, outcomes are not just for evaluation. Making decisions based on data is also important in all layers. So I don't know if you, there's anything within there that you wanted to comment on. Additionally, let me look to see if there are any other questions coming in. And remember, people, you can put your question into the chat box. Um, I'll get us started a little bit, um, Anne or or Catherine, can you can you talk about some ways that you can use the tool in different different ways? For example, having an individual use it versus having an organization use it to to structure leadership for the entire organization. Do you want to? Uh, and why don't you take that first? Oh, okay. No, I'd love for you <laughs> well, to start first because you've been well, using it at Johns Hopkins. Well, yeah. Um, as I mentioned, uh, kind of at the top of the webinar, um, I've I've included the the layers uh, with graduate students, and not really to go through it like we not even to really go through it like we've gone through it here today, but to really just kind of quickly touch upon some things and give people some ideas as to um, what they need to think about in terms of their skill development um, and the and certainly the key roles and challenges. And I have to say that it has been like a, I don't know, a bolt from out the blue that for many of, of, of the students that I've engaged with on this, that they have uh, just never really had an opportunity to think about uh, leadership as something that can be shaped and, and built. And, um, and, and so that's been one way for an individual and I've used it myself in sort of thinking about my career path as well. Even at my late stage, my, even in my old age, I've been able to think about it and, and really kind of um, think about the strengths and weaknesses that I have regarding leadership and, mm -hmm. and what I might be able to do going forward in terms of training and development. So I think it's a wonderful tool to use individually certainly. Catherine, do you want to throw in on 
on that? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll say old age my foot. Um, but but the, uh, the other ways that we're hearing people uh, talk about using it, and I'll echo what, what Ann just mentioned, there's several other graduate schools, both on the kind of libraries and archive side as well as on the museum side that either are already using it or are thinking about using it. Um, one, one additional museum studies program at uh, University of Florida is now thinking about using it. Um, and there are four or five uh, active users already in the, the library and archive space. Um, but what one of the things that I've heard from those folks is that the concept of forming a leadership brand is part of what that, that kind of revelatory moment is for students especially, who realize that it's, it's something that they really do have to think about and, and need to think about how they're presenting themselves from that leadership perspective from the beginning of their careers. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the other places where we're seeing it used uh, are associations that are using this as a framework to actually revamp their entire uh, uh, kind of continuing education pathway. So one that I'll mention on that is the Association of Research Libraries, ARL, which uh, went through a comprehensive kind of street strategic realignment of their educational programs just last year. And Mark Puente was part of the team that helped to build this, uh, this tool, and he's, of course, uh, a major player there that I'm sure many of you uh, have either heard of or come into contact with. And he took this to ARL's leadership to say, I think this is something that we should, should look at and consider. And it did wind up being a formative backbone for their, their entire process. And then on the, the more local level, there are a lot of uh, states and individual libraries and associations that at this point are using the framework to help them identify what their training uh, opportunities are providing. So are they, are they really cultivating some of the competencies that are in the leading the department area or are they doing more with leading self? Where are the gaps? Where are the opportunities in their own uh, training programs? And they're using this particular tool to help them identify those places that they want to grow. So it's been really exciting to see a lot of different uses for, for this particular tool. It gets a lot of mileage in, in different environments. I think uh, I'll just add, uh, as I mentioned a, a, a bit ago, that I, I see it as a potential tool uh, for supervisors to use with their direct reports, um, especially those direct reports who have evinced interest in, in sort of developing leadership skills. Well, well, here's a framework that we can maybe work together on in our workplace to help get you those skills. Um, you talked earlier, Catherine, about stretch assignments. You know that that's a Absolutely. in the 70, yep. 70, 10, 20 rule or 70, 20, 10 rule that 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 70% is just kind of taking on assignments that are, that are going to bring you in contact with, with skills and skills that you can nurture and hone. And, um, and so, I mean, that's, that's to me is all part of how um, those conversations with uh, direct reports uh, about their careers uh, uh, can play out. And this could be the tool that, that helps those conversations along. Absolutely, and I'd be remiss not to mention that actually my board is now using this uh, as part of my evaluation this year. Um, David Horth from the Center for Creative Leadership, who was a, a big part of the uh, the project that created this, um, he he certainly knows of our work with this tool, and he spotlighted it with the other board members just three or four weeks ago and told them that he wanted to start using this as a way of um, helping to cultivate me as well as an executive director. <laughs> so it is, you know, on a personal level, I'm going to get really familiar with this uh, <laughs> over the course of the next couple of weeks as that, that review takes place. Um, but, but uh, you know, funny, funny that you should mention that supervisor <laughs> use of it. Uh, and it's, it's definitely something that's going to be happening in my neck of the woods. You know, and you mentioned the stretch assignments and we actually have a question from uh, someone asking how do you make it sufficiently challenging but not setting staff up for failure talking about stretch assignments oh I, I think maybe one I think maybe one way to do that is to talk through with the staff person 
what that assignment might look like and you know de and develop those outcomes as Connie Graft was mentioning um, that you would have kind of approach it that same way as you know what's what's the gap here that we're trying to fill with this assignment and what are our anticipated outcomes and how are we going to get there and I think maybe you know being deliberate like that in in identifying and setting stretch assignments hopefully will will accomplish what what the employee and what the supervisor needs without without it being um, without it blowing up and um, and and being a failure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the thing that I would add to that is that that 20% uh, focus on mentorship, if that mm -hmm. piece is deliberately aligned with those stretch assignments, then it makes sure that that staff member isn't, uh, you know, expected to suddenly deliver more on their own. They have someone that they can turn to or maybe multiple people that they can turn to. And so really coupling that, uh, that mentorship role with those stretch assignments, I think, is a really important piece of this. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I love the mentorship programs. I know that um, I think the profession, greater profession has that. Do you have any uh, suggestions or directions toward developing maybe a mentorship program that institutions can do or that even individuals seeking out those types of relationships outside mm -hmm. of the organization? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gosh, there, you know, there's a, a lot been written about mentoring and mentorships and establishing programs and so forth, so I'm not sure I can say anything new or different mm -hmm. about it. But um, I, I think, think you should point everybody to your book, though, Anne, because you, you do a lot of <laughs> oh. discussion there, actually, <laughs> of exactly that. Leadership matters. Leadership <laughs> yeah. matters. Yeah. Um, I think it needs, you know, whatever, however you, you know, want to kind of encourage mentorship, it's got to be a deliberate, it's got to be deliberate, and it's, you know, it's, um, the, the the supervisor you know needs needs to do what he or she can to make it happen and to support support the the mentoring process and it um, and yes it can be done informally as well you don't have to have some big elaborate program uh, it certainly can be done informally um, and there's a lot of question about whether your mentor should come from within your institution or outside your institution. I think it all depends really on what uh, what you're seeking to get out of a mentorship as to whether or not you want to try and mentor with someone in your institution or without. But I will say this, I think it's a, a wonderful opportunity for everybody to mentor someone. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, that uh, the, the act of mentoring is just as important as it, uh, for the mentor as it is for the mentee. And so I think it's something to encourage. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly on that. Well, thank you. Um, I look and see we have time maybe for one more question, if anyone has. We're kind of getting close on the time. Um, and, and I'll I'll just respond to Allie. I I you know I the the webinars this year, the COSA webinars that are. Um, are dedicated to, to leadership um, and management issues uh, in the series this year, and I think what are there four or five of them all together. Um, so uh, there's more coming um, uh, up in the next couple of months, Allie. So I hope you can make them. And I, you know, I, I agree. I think you know, as we look at a lot of graduate programs, this kind of stuff just isn't in the curriculum yet. But um, as Catherine was saying, more graduate programs are starting to pick up. It's not the layers of leadership, some aspect of, of leadership training, and, and that's a great thing. It's something that we really, um, we really uh, applaud. Great. Thank you so much. And so um, I guess on that, that note, we can pass along to Mary Margaret, who I'm sure will tell us more about upcoming webinars. Mary, how's that for a segue? <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> Thank you both. Catherine and, and Anne for your for your presentation. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having us. Okay, thank you. That was great. Now we're going to uh, look ahead, and we are drawing ever closer to the 2018 COSA Nagara SAA annual meeting, going to be in Washington D.C. 
And we uh, will have the Archives on the Hill event on Tuesday, August 14th, jointly sponsored by COSA, NAGARA, SAA, and the Regional Archival Associations. And more information will be coming out as we get closer to that. Wednesday, August 15th, the Great Idea Exchange Day and Work Session at NARA, the Business Meeting and Awards Dinner also that day. And then the following day, the Plenary Session Awards Ceremony and the Silent Auction on Thursday, August 16th. So those are things to look forward to. And let me hit the right thing here. Now we're going to talk about our upcoming webinars. Um, we are continuing, we're going to have the fourth Thursday of the month uh, at 3 p.m. Eastern. We'll continue the 2018 webinar series. And we're going to have uh, project management part one on June 28th with Sharon Leon. And then uh, she will also do a part two on July 26th. Uh, because we, the webinar in August will come right after that annual meeting I just mentioned, that'll be the annual meeting wrap up and have a lot of good information then. And then on September 27th, uh, we'll have another Shrab Town Hall. So I know that will be uh, of interest as well. And then we also have uh, some other webinars to talk about. Uh, we just had a Siri webinar a few days ago, and we're going to have another one on June 19th devoted to blockchain, and that's a really interesting topic. A lot of people are interested in hearing more about that. Uh, Nick Conizzo with the uh, Vermont State Archives uh, will be that presenter. We're going to start a quarterly series in July, joint webinars with NARA and COSA working together. And I uh, think there'll be some interesting topics there. And then uh, this fall, we're going to have our Shop Talk webinars from uh, the top level corporate sponsors for COSA. And that will be Ancestry, uh, Preservica, and Apex. And so stay tuned, and we'll get more information about that as we draw nearer uh, to those dates. Once again, like we always do, we want to thank our sponsors and funders for the 2018 um, activities, uh, particularly Ancestry, Family Search, Preservica, LibNova, Apex, Gaylord Archival, Space Saver, NHPRC, and IMLS. As I mentioned, we're always putting out news about our activities, and here are the good ways to stay connected and informed. Uh, the COSA website, uh, www.statearchivist.org, uh, the COSA Resource Center there at the COSA website, our COSA Twitter uh, handle, which pro provides a lot of information on a regular basis, as does our COSA Facebook page. And so uh, links for all of those are made available to you. And before we close, once again, we will we'll request you to uh, complete the webinar evaluation. And we really do appreciate your feedback, and it gives us a chance to see what you thought about these presentations and um, give us information for future events. After you exit the webinar, you'll automatically be taken to that online evaluation. Please take a minute or two to complete the survey and help us plan for the future. Uh, thanks to everyone uh, today with a really another great presentation, and thanks to all the attendees and your good questions and attention, and we're going to look forward to uh, seeing you again next month.